on to today's webinar on the hidden cost of global employment, what you need to know to better plan for and control your overseas costs. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the CFO Roundtable, the premier CFO education and networking group on the East Coast, and Naren Company, offering services to protect you overseas with integrated HR, tax, accounting, and legal services. My name is Becky Blackler, Executive Director of the CFO Roundtable, and I'll be your host for today's program. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce our panelists and presenter for today's program. Joining us today are Joseph Balcao, CFO of McHugh Corporation, Tammy Peary, Vice President of Human Resources and Administration with Black Duck Software, and Julie Sincotti, Director of Human Resources for Buy All Accounts, all of whom will be sharing their expertise and real-world experiences in international expansion with us today. Our presenter for today's program, Stuart Buglass, Director of Human Capital Consulting with Naren Company. Stuart leads Naren Company's international HR service that handles employment law, compensation and benefits, stock options, expatriate tax, and immigration-related issues for the 60-plus countries where current clients have foreign offices. Stuart successfully operated as an international contract CFO for several years before returning to international HR service, which he previously developed into a full-scale unit. Without further ado, Stuart, please take it away. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'd um, like to start by thanking Becky and the CFO Roundtable for hosting this event and also to Tammy, Julie, and Joe for joining us to share in their experiences. So the aim of today's webinar is to provide you a financial context to international employment. So employing people overseas can be an expensive business. However, by sharing some insider knowledge with you, we can help you anticipate and potentially avoid the high ticket items. So what we'll be covering today is how low cost countries can become a money pit, how shortcuts to avoid employment costs can prove to be more expensive in the long term, avoiding runaway costs when providing benefits to your international employees, knowing the true extent of your mandatory costs, how US employment practices don't always travel well, how remotely managed employees often push the boundaries and increase your costs, and the big two, the various outgoings associated with leave and termination. So let's make a start with shortcuts that prove costly. There's been a recent trend to make extended use of business travelers as an alternative to either a traditional expat assignment or local employees. And you know from the bottom line, this appears to make really good sense. So organizations have quickly embraced this and have mastered the system of pulling employees out of country just before they reach the limit of their visa. And once the status is refreshed, they push them back in. However, it can be a very high risk strategy. Few companies consider the tax, tax risks that can be created by a sustained presence. Both the corporate tax liabilities that can stem from a local PE assessment and also the personal tax liabilities that attach to the employee. So when it comes to personal tax residents, many of our clients cite the 183 day rule as a hard and fast test. So long as the employee stays below the 183 days rule, then no taxes will ensue. However, this is really simplistic. The 183-day rule is generally a product of tax treaties. If there's no tax treaty between the destination country and the home country, then in many cases the threshold drops. And in many cases, that can be as low as 30 days in country. So let's face it, business visitors are generally well paid and they don't hold a local vote. For a tax hungry government, if there is such a thing as a perfect victim, then this comes close. Revenue authorities have joined up thinking now. Gone are the days when the personal tax departments were siloed away from their corporate tax counterparts. So a personal tax investigation can quickly lead to an expensive defense of a permanent establishment inquiry. Looking at the immigration perspective, organizations often believe that moving travelers in and out of country in line with permitted visa timescales is all that's required. However, this pays lip service to a fundamental point of immigration law, whether the local activities are work-related or simply visitor-related. The permitted activities of a business visitor are generally restricted to training courses, meetings, and conferences. Anything more substantial is likely to be assessed as a work activity and requiring a work permit. Visits that are of a short-term 
nature are more likely to be viewed as business visit activities, but a pattern of longer term sustained visits raise a presumption that their work activities and passport control are increasingly on the lookout for these. And therefore, what started out as a shortcut or a quick fix can often land you with an immigration violation, mounting personal tax and social security liabilities with additional penalties, and in many cases, a local PE. However, it's not just business visitors. So another favored shortcut for international businesses is the use of contractor agreements in place of appointing a local employee. And that negates the need for a payroll, so it saves on your social security costs and saves on the local infrastructure to support it. Now with regards to contractors, what needs to be borne in mind is that obviously there's employment tests. So if you've got a contractor and you've got a contractor agreement, I mean many of you will be very aware to make sure that the contractor agreement steers well clear of any references that would um, attach uh, an employment status to it. So you bear in mind that there's not going to be any holidays or notice um, of termination in there. You make sure that there's no employee benefits actually mentioned in the contractor agreement as well. So all in all, the contractor agreement does sound and, and look as if it's an independent relationship. However, by doing that, you run headlong into another risk. And that is, if it isn't an employment relationship and the individual is spending some time in the sales process, then invariably it will be assessed under the local commercial agency rules. So with regards to commercial agency, what you need to be very aware of is where an individual falls within the definition of a commercial agent, essentially the local statutes will provide them with minimum conditions. So there will be minimum conditions for um, commission payments for termination notice, and there will also be some minimum terms with regards to a termination indemnity. Now, usually that is a payment, and it could be a sizable payment, payable on termination, and it's deemed to be compensation for any goodwill that the contract has actually generated for you, um, and it can be a sizable payment. So it, it's worth avoiding commercial agency regulations at all cost. And another um, sting in the tail from a, a, a tax perspective is where you've got a relationship that is assessed as commercial agency, then essentially most tax authorities will deem that as being enough to, to land you a permanent establishment due to the deemed agency rules in that country as well. So with regards to, to all of this, then obviously there's a few things to be mindful of when you're making quick fixes in a, in a local country. That takes us on to our second topic. So topic two is your mandatory employer costs, and it's not just Social Security. So what we mean by this is very often when you're going to a, a new country, you'll be mindful to budget around the actual salaries and also um, what the Social Security costs are going to be. And in some countries, that Social Security cost will be as much as 40% on top of the actual salary. So it's a, it's a good thing to actually budget, not just for the salaries, but also the social security costs. But to be honest, in a lot of countries, that um, actually doesn't consider all of the potential employer costs that you may run into. So there's a lot of hidden costs that only through probing and um, scratching below the surface are you actually going to uncover. So I'll give you some examples, and this will put into perspective the type of things that you may come across. So in some countries, the general social security contributions will actually cover workman's compensation insurance. So when there's a, a workplace injury or a death, then essentially the, the social security contributions that you're paying month on month through payroll will actually cover the, the liabilities attached to that. But in other countries, and there's, there's quite a few of those, the, the actual liabilities need to be covered by a private insurance. And those providers that are capable of actually providing that insurance are those that are regulated and um, on a permitted list in that local country. So it's not as if you can actually get coverage extended from your, your US carriers. Very often you'll need to consider actually getting cover in local country. 
And the difficulty you've got there is you need to sometimes consider where you're operating across a number of different, different states, then in each of those states where you have an employee, you'll have to have a different policy. Some of the other sort of costs that you may come across um, and are potentially hidden from view are some of the severance costs. So you have your Social Security, um, but in addition to that, on termination, there's a liability to pay a severance um, amount. Now, in a country such as Italy, you've got the option to actually contribute that into a, a proper fund. So it's a tangible amount of money that's actually being invested every month. But there's also an option um, to, to accrue that amount as an accounting entry. And if you didn't know that as a, a new entrant into to Italy, you wouldn't obviously make the option to have that physical sum contributed every month. And you'd be expected to make the accounting entry. And it's it hasn't gone unnoticed by um, a lot of organizations going into Italy that when they terminate their first employee, they get a shock because this severance payment that should have been accrued in their books hasn't been. And it's a, it's a rather large lump sum to actually pay out on termination. Um, as another example, and that there are sort of numerous and, and varied mandatory costs acro across the world, but just to try and give you a smattering of, of, of how they can appear, um, one of the left field ones is, is profit sharing, where it's a mandatory profit share. And in countries in Cala, um, I mean, Mexico and, and Chile have this requirement where an employer has to do mandatory profit sharing. And the difficulty with that is, obviously, if you're, you're sort of functioning um, and your transfer pricing arrangements are based upon a cost plus, that local entity is always going to be in profit, and therefore, you're always going to be paying out on that profit share. Um, it's, it's worth bearing in mind in Chile you can actually sort of replace the profit share of a bonus scheme, um, but you have to have that in the employment contract from the, out, out, um, from the offset. So unless you know um, to do that, then obviously you won't, and again, you'll be stung because your cost plus entity will always be in profit and you're paying out on that. One of the other areas is um, where you have um, mandatory salary increases every year. So you may budget for your salary increases to be out of a pay pot, and that's a global pay pot, and you split it per country. But what you don't realize is in countries such as in, in Italy and in, in Belgium, you'll have a mandatory um, requirement to actually uplift salaries by a certain percentage. So as soon as the minimum, minimum salary goes up, um, effectively that has a, an impact on all of, the, all of the other salaries because every salary will then have to be increased by that same percentage. So it is food for thought, um, but I think from experience, the biggest source of, of hidden employment costs is um, collective agreements. What a lot of our clients fail to, to consider when they go into a country is they may have one eye on the statutory requirements. They may have another eye on what's written into the contract of employment. But what they don't realize is if they operate in a particular industry, there'll be a mandatory collective agreement that applies to them, regardless as to whether they've signed up to it or not. And um, in countries such as uh, Italy, Spain, the Scandinavian countries, and again, in Latin America, the, those supplemental terms through the collective agreements will add an awful lot to, this, to the statutory minimum that you would no doubt have had to pay um, anyway. This is an extra layer on top of that, so it does, does add to your costs. Um, and I think I'll, I'll probably draw um, Joe into the conversation again here, because I know that Joe spent um, a lot of time um, operating in Latin America, and I think his experiences are probably most valid to, to these hidden costs. Um, where the, the local outgoings can obviously affect your, your local budgets. Would that be true, Joe? Yes, it is. Uh, so in countries like Brazil, Argentina, uh, so as you mentioned, there is an annual increase which is defined by the government. And the intent of the annual increase is like a call adjustment, a cost of living adjustment, is to make sure uh, the employees are recovering uh, based on the inflation rate. Uh, and also in these uh, countries of Brazil and China, which may be uh, at a fast pace of growth, there's a strong pressure for the salaries to go up above and beyond what the government might be telling. If the information is not very strong between the 
the local entity, maybe with few people and the parent office, it can create some tension because in the U.S. you may be modeling, let's call it 3% or 5% of selling increase, while the expectation down in Brazil or Argentina can be 10, 20, or 30%. And yeah. it's basically that's to remain even. And if this is not well defined, um, it can impact the motivation and the trust between the parent and the um, and the local sub. So I think getting proper insight is very helpful. Yeah, I think that's the message from from certainly this slide is the fact that you just need that local intelligence before you, you just budget based upon salary and what you would see as the headline social security costs because there's a whole lot more to, to, to consider, especially in Southern Europe and Latin America, I feel. So um, so we can move on, I think, to topic three now, which um, again sort of focuses on these countries whereby um, y y you may get a shock. And I think it it's fair to say that the title sums it up quite nicely, when low-cost countries turn bad. I think most of us um, are guilty of, of following that next trend. Mm -hmm. So we've had the BRIC countries, and I think we're, we're into the mint countries now, which, um, if you didn't know, is, is Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. And these are the, the obviously the countries where you, you, you consider are, are developing nations, um, hungry for your products, and um, but also countries that you're probably going to have low um, labor costs. And what generally happens is you, you, you can tend to get a surprise. What you budget as those low labor costs don't always turn out to be so. So if you think about the, um, the real savings of low hourly rates when you actually start operating in a particular country, what we find is with a lot of these countries, the wage inflation can be absolutely rampant. So it's not unusual for, for the wage inflation to be sort of 15 to 20 percent. But I mean, at the minute, over the last sort of 12 months in countries such as Argentina and Venezuela, that's, um, it, it's, it's looking like 25% per annum. So if that continues over, say, four years, then, I mean, I'm not an accountant, but that works out at um, doubling your labor costs. So it's something to be very mindful of. Um, now, that's on the basis that you actually get the labor um, in post. So for, for many of our clients, actually filling the positions can be very, very difficult. Everyone's hunting down candidates with good English skills and the commercial experience. And what you find is those positions, um, sorry, those candidates are in short demand. Um, and we, I mean, we've got surveys. And one of the recent surveys that we've got is um, the manpower survey from, from last year. And it's showing that about 70% of employers in Brazil are really struggling to get their posts filled. And what you find is that the knock-on effect of not being able to fill a post um, because of skill shortages, it, it just creates this talent war. And with a talent war, you're going to get um, increases to salary costs. But not only that, you've got this, this constant churn, um, high attrition rates, and it diverts all of your management time, and it's just a vicious circle that, that adds to your costs. Now, what we, we tend to see as well in these developing um, countries, it's not just the, the sort of top line um, sort of wage inflation figures you've got to think about. You've got to think about the, the impact of um, the, the sort of socio, the economic, and the political issues that often thwart um, an employer's plans. Because I mean, what we've seen is we, we supported a, a number of our clients um, in the Far East. Um, during the Arab Spring, and I mean the the, the positive impact of the sweeping social improvements um, weren't, weren't in doubt, but it also had an impact on the employers. So, um, if you take Oman for 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 a, a example, the minimum wage increased by about forty odd percent. Um, the pensions, the public pensions for public sector employees, increased by about a hundred percent. Public sector employment went up by about fifty thousand additional posts. And for our clients, I mean, the, the impact on them as private sector employers just pushed up the wage costs and the benefits that they had to provide as well. So you've got to keep an eye on, on, on those sort of developments. Um, I mean, slightly left field, we've had similar issues in Mexico where um, due to sort of increasing crime in the north, 
a lot of the employers in the north are suffering from a brain drain. A lot of the technical and professional employees are now moving to the south um, because it's a better place to bring up their families. And that's happened over the last sort of couple of years. Um, it's just a changing landscape for, for our clients to actually deal with. Um, so I think the, 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 message to, the message to get across on this slide is a low-cost destination, um, what you may budget, um, doesn't always get realized. And again, it, it's something that possibly our panelists can, can add a bit of flavor to because um, I mean, all organizations try and get a mix between the developing nations and the, the developed with regards to the skill sets they require and the markets that they pursue. I'm just wondering if um, Joe, Tammy, and um, whether you've actually experienced those sort of issues where what you've budgeted um, isn't actually what you're, what you're spending. I stood, uh, if you want to go first, is um, I think I experienced like uh, attempts under budgeting the cost of the employee for two reasons. One is the cost to attract the, the talent was much more expensive than what we had in mind. So it's mm -hmm. much more fallacy thinking it's a low cost country, but the talent who can really understand the local market and be able to communicate in the same way how we conduct business in US and Europe, uh, they're very few and they're very expensive. And also the layers of the cost uh, to employ someone in, in the country. So all the layers of cost be, need to be captured properly. The, the, the mistakes that tends to be make is say, well, it's your monthly salary, you multiply by 12, and that becomes annual salary. In fact, we need to, monthly salary, that's one element. There are other hidden layers of cost of the employee that need to be captured. Yeah. And I mean, you've obviously experienced Brazil. and. I mean, we, we obviously see um, some of the salaries that our clients have to pay, and, and interestingly, um, compared to the US, I, I do believe from a, from a management role, um, where you try and fill your management roles in, in Brazil, I think the, the, the wage costs are now about 120% of what they are in the US. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a big real difference there. No, I, on, a, on a personal level, I, I worked many years in Brazil, and, and similar years in the U.S. and uh, the joke in my household is my wife told me I could uh, make more money if I'd gone back to Brazil <laughs> because of the demand. Of the demand. So it was, uh, and, and for some, some other reasons it doesn't make sense for, I mean, from a family security, etc. But it's, uh, the fact is the, the pay is higher and the benefits are better in Brazil than in the U.S. for comparable, comparable uh, job, uh, job responsibility. So it's, yeah, it's something yeah. you have to think very well. I think the point comes back, what's the economic return of the investment out of your home country? Are you going to recover the cost? How much risk are going to be exposed? And what's the, what's the return you're going to get? Yeah, very good point. Um, yeah, so I, I think we can, we can move on um, in the interests of time to, to our next slide. So the, the, the next one is the, the obviously the, the big two. Um, when our clients go into a new country and they, they, they want to obviously scope out that country, the, the first question they always ask is, so, so what are the annual leave and what are the termination costs going to look like? And I mean, they are valid questions, but um, I think even for the most battle-hardened um, international HR practitioners, there, there's still some surprises. So if, um, if you look at how some countries actually calculate the day's leave. Um, there, there's, there's different ways of doing that, and you would um, be mistaken for thinking that it's just based upon basic salary. Well, to be honest, it, it's not necessarily so. So, for example, in the Netherlands, um, an individual will receive a basic salary but also receive a vacation bonus. Um, and over the course of the year, it's equivalent to about 0.8 of a month's salary. In Australia, they also do this where they, they basically um, add a premium onto the salary. Um, so it's basic salary plus about 17.5%, um, depending upon the collective agreement. And um, so, that, so that obviously impacts on, on, again, how you budget um, for, for, for your annual salaries. Now, what's interesting as well with regards to, to annual leave is just how much annual leave an individual will actually get 
And you can start off with obviously a, an amount in the employment contract, but unbeknown to you, in addition to that, there's an underpinning statute, and that statute will actually increase that amount year on year um, with, with service, or it could be with the individual's age. And in some countries, such as Hungary, they actually increase the, um, the vacation allowance um, with how many um, children the individual actually has. So, so there's some interesting takes on, on, on annual leave. And again, for the uninitiated, it, it's an open question that you need to ask, just how do they calculate a day's leave? Um, I mean, with regards to termination, um, obviously we're going to cover the big two. It's um, it, the biggest mistake we see with clients is they look at the employment contract and they'll see the notice of termination and they'll think, well, the notice of termination is four weeks. That's not bad because at the end of the day, we can terminate. We just need to, to consider it's going to cost us four weeks. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we've done a fair termination. Well, to be honest, what they, they don't appreciate is employment contracts the world over will actually probably cover just what's negotiated between the parties. They're not covering the statutory minimum requirements that are underpinned by all of the, the federal labor laws. And in those labor laws, in most countries, is a requirement for there to be a fair dismissal. Um, or put it another way, you need to have just cause to terminate. And this is where, in a lot of countries, that evidential burden or the bar to actually um, prove just cause is so high that even the most experienced local employers can't actually meet it. So you tend to find that you're going you're to have negotiated settlements. And in countries such as Japan, the negotiated settlement, um, you're looking at a couple of months per year of employment. Um, and if you don't do this negotiated settlement, you, you've got to be very, very wary of the fact that the individual will probably win in court, but it takes around five years for the court to actually hear the case. And a number of employers have had their fingers burned because the way that the court operate is if they find in favor of the employee at the, the court hearing, then they'll actually pay back pay for the, for the individual for the period that they've waited um, to, to get the court appearance. So, but, Say it's an average of five years to get a court appearance, you've terminated the guy, and you will have to pay that five years um, duration in wages. Um, so yeah, so it can be very expensive. So it, it always pays in these countries to know what the ground rules are, and if you can, do a negotiated settlement. What, um, what I'd like to, to, to consider here is, obviously, with, with our panelists, to, to, to get an opportunity to ask them with regards to terminations as to where they've potentially had their fingers burnt. And this, this point about you've got to look beyond the notice of termination because your, your costs certainly aren't going to be limited to that. It would be nice to, to, to obviously draw upon experiences where the costs have obviously mounted up way, way beyond that. Um, so, so Tammy, I, I, I understand obviously you, you've spent a number of years spending time um, managing international employment issues in a number of countries and obviously experienced terminations during that, that course of time. So have you had your fingers burned? Yes. Most recently I had my fingers burned um, with an employee in France where the employee was a sales individual not performing, not hitting his target year after year. And the termination practice in France is a lengthy process. Um, and thankfully, through the services of NAIR and having great advisors, um, we were able to, to minimize the length of time. Um, but you do need to set up um, proper meetings. There's, there's an initial meeting that you have to have uh, where an employee can bring a representative um, and bring the case to the fact that the employee is not performing. Um, then you have legal proceedings that you must file um, so on average, you know, I wasn't aware that terminations in France could be upwards of six to nine months with respect to legal implications, court appearance. Um, and, and lastly, I think the thing that most surprised me was that in order for an employee in France to be terminated, since there is no non-competition um, uh, availability or anyone's not allowed to enforce a non-competition, that an employee actually can be paid to enforce 
the fact that they wouldn't go to work for a uh, competitor. Um, and in this situation in France, uh, worked the situation at, came to the negotiation, followed all the procedures, um, and the employee did agree finally that he wouldn't go to work for a competitor, but we had to pay um, a lengthy sum in euros to, to make that uh, happen. So in France it was uh, quite an experience. I've also had recent experiences in the UK, but I think France was the one most recently that was uh, most surprising to me. Yeah. It's a it's a good example. I mean, France. It's always a win-win for the for the individual, and it's worth noting this evidential bar um, to try and prove just cause is just almost impossible in France. So, where you've got a poor performer, um, I mean, you could try and do a performance improvement plan and waste an awful lot of time of senior management's time. Um, a lot of those meetings need to be face to face. You need to obviously show that you've got training and support. And you know what? You can do all of that, and still at the end, you've got that negotiated settlement. So, yeah, it, it's almost the case in 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 France where you're you, you're starting with with the understanding that you've got to have a negotiated settlement, and you almost shortcut um, a lot of the performance improvement plans like you would do in other countries. So, um, let's move on. Um, we'll move on to our next topic, and it's headed up. It's not the same as home, and. What we, mean, what we mean by that is, obviously, the termination, the annual leave, a lot of the mandatory terms, you all appreciate that that's going to be different. So you, you possibly look out for those sort of things. But there's, um, you'd be forgiven for thinking that some of your, your standard sort of US employment pra practices are beyond the remit of that local legislation. So, so the common mistakes we see are that there's an, an assumption that the, the US stock schemes apply consistently across all locations. Um, and it's it's understandable why you would think that, because obviously it's US equity. Um, it's the US agreement and the US plan that's actually offered to, to, to the individuals to sign up with. But what it does gloss over is the fact that locally, there's local tax rules and there's local employment rules that do actually make a difference. Um, so if we look at the, the tax position um, with regards to your, your your stock schemes and how that actually does vary per country. Um, you can draw upon a, a, the, the fact that when an individual will exercise or when there's vesting or when there's a sale, um, depending upon the country, the tax point can change. So in some countries, you'll be taxing that exercise. In other countries, you could potentially be taxing during vesting. Um, so you've got to know the lie of the land with regards to what that tax point is. And if you really dig down, you may be able to actually influence the tax point to be of benefit to you as the employer. So in the UK, you can actually get um, the employer social security charge, which will be a real liability to you, which is usually charged at exercise. You can get that passed over to the employee through an, an election document that you can actually um, file with HMRC. Um, likewise, in Belgium, if the individual actually offers, um, sorry, accepts the offer of stock within the first 60 days, then there's no employer social security. But if they don't accept within 60 days and they let that lapse beyond 60 days, then essentially there's going to be employer social security on exercise. So that there's some strange local quirks that can actually cost you as an employer if you don't know um, what those, those local rules are. I mean, with regards to stock, it's not just all about tax, because employment laws can make a difference as well. Um, one of the best examples of that is in um, Denmark, where you terminated employees. Um, if, if an employee is terminated for anything other than gross misconduct, essentially what happens is the, the local regulations will actually allow them to, to have their unvested stock. Um, whereas in most countries, the unvested stock will lapse. Not in Denmark. They actually allow the, the individuals to keep that. Um, so what you'll tend to find is local employers will have not just um, a staggering of the, 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 um, the grant and um, the vesting, they'll actually stagger the grant as well. So you're not granting all of the options at the, at the same time due to these, these vesting rules. Um, I mean... With regards to the, to the U.S. agreements, it's not just the stock agreements that we, we see um, 
are commonly provided to international employees. We also see um, the works for hire. So where you, in the US you've got the pre-invention um, assignment agreement that are commonly signed at the same time as the employment contract, we often see those same documents being used for international employees as well. Um, and it, it can be a big mistake because in most countries you can't actually waive your right to um, an invention prior to it being actually invented. So it's got to happen at the time of the invention and it's, it usually requires some sort of formal um, letter of approach from the employer and as part of that usually you've got to negotiate um, some consideration, some compensation for the individual as part of that approach. Now if you don't do any of that and you're relying upon your US pre-invention assignment agreement, then effectively that, is, that invention isn't going to be your works for hire for you. Essentially the, the ownership will continue to vest in the employee. So it can be an expensive mistake to actually use your US agreements um, in those circumstances. Also uh, of relevance is, um, and again this is the third document we often see provided to, to international employees, is your non-competes, um, the non-disclosure agreements, the confidentiality agreements, usually all bundled into one document and very often offered to all of the international employees when they're, 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 they're sort of hired um, from day one. And again it can be a costly mistake. Now what we tend to see is um, a lot of our US clients will apply that indiscriminately to every single employee without the, the knowledge that in a lot of countries on termination, a post-termination restriction such as a non-compete which may operate for say 12 to 24 months, in a lot of countries, and this is what Tammy just touched upon in France, um, is the fact that you have to pay the individual an amount of money for that um, for that restriction to actually apply and it's usually a monthly stipend, it can be as much as 100% um, of the individual's um, previous monthly salary and you have to pay that throughout the duration of the non-compete. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a, a lesson um, because you don't really want to be offering this indiscriminately to every single employee um, because even poor performers on termination you're going to have to pay them um, this amount of money um, if, you, if that non-compete kicks in. So the wily of you are probably thinking, well, yeah, let's do the non-compete indiscriminately um, and then we'll just waive it prior to, to the termination. But you'll find that a lot of countries you'll need to um, provide notice um, to waive that non-compete prior to termination. And that waiver often needs a notice period that is as long as the restrictive period itself. So if you've got a 12-month non-compete, you would have to give 12-month notice to waive the restriction on termination. Um, so yeah, so you can get your fingers burnt there, and it would pay to, to have locally um, drafted non-compete, certainly, um, for, for employees in Europe. Um, with regards to um, the, the international um, sales employees that you've probably got operating around the globe, um, it's common because obviously you want the international sales employees to be reporting sales in a consistent fashion. It's common to have them all signed up to the same type of commission scheme and it makes sense because it's fair, it's equitable, you're not going to have um, issues with regards to inequality across, across continents. But what you'll find is that again there's different approaches in country to how a commission scheme will work for sales employees. And I think the best example of this is, if we can draw upon France again, is the fact that in France, if that non-compete isn't in French language, then a court will actually say, well, look, we, we, we think the employee didn't really understand the salient points, and therefore the individual is entitled to 100% of the the target compensation regardless of their performance. So make sure that your commission schemes for your French employees are always written in French. So I think, um, I mean that covers that, that topic pretty well um, and I think in the interest of time because we've got another slide um, or two to cover, I think we'll move straight on to um, topic number six which is employee benefits. And I think 
the, the main issue here with employee benefits is you're probably used to dealing with employee um, benefits from the US and you've got a sizable headcount in, in those countries. Um, so in the US you might have, I don't know, 60 to, to 100, um, possibly a bit more um, in the way of, of headcount. And what that means is you can access certain policies, you can get coverages for all of your employees. There's no personal underwriting, there's no individual policies. Now, if you go into a new country, then invariably your, your headcount is going to be a lot lower. Um, now, the mistake a lot of our clients will make is they'll make a commitment in, the, in an employment contract to providing medical cover for an individual. Now, say that individual um, has cover already on a personal scheme, they might actually, actually relinquish that cover on the promise of you providing them cover. And if it's just one individual, you'll go to the insurance broker and the broker will say, well, look, it's going to have to be individually underwritten um, because you haven't got the headcount for a group scheme and therefore it's going to be subject to, to a medical questionnaire. Now, in, in, in those circumstances, if the individual's got pre-existing conditions, then they're not going to get that covered under the new scheme. Or if they are, it's going to be prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. So in that circumstance, you've got to, to either pay the individual um, for, for the cover or not provide the cover at all. So you can get you can get some difficult situations just purely because your headcount is a lot lower um, in, in a lot of these countries. Now the other issue on benefits is it's it's an issue when you set up in a new country that you may have your entity but you might not have trading history, you might not have not have a, an operational bank account. Now certainly from a, a company car perspective, if you're hoping to get car leases for your individuals, you're not actually going to be able to secure those if you haven't got um, banking history. So it's something to bear in mind. If you haven't got banking history, don't commit in a contract of employment that you're going to provide a company car because you're not going to get a lease and you're probably going to have to purchase that, um, that car outright. Um, otherwise, you're going to breach the employment contract. So um, with regards to, to employee benefits, um, the, 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 there's obviously a lot to discuss, but I think the, the main points are that your headcount is a consideration. The lower the headcount, the less likely you're going to be able to match or, or mimic the type of schemes that you've got in the US. And also the fact that your trading history, if you're in your infancy, it's not going to be supportive to things like a company car lease. Now, I think we'll move straight on to our last topic. Um, to give us enough time to obviously go through some questions at the end. So with regards to this, it's, it's essentially the fact that you've got these remote employees. Very often it's a small headcount. You haven't got local management actually um, monitoring um, th these guys. So the, the heading is don't be hoodwinked by your remote employees. Um, and what we mean by that is if in our experience, if you're not monitoring them closely, then invariably you tend to find that their office hours are sky high compared to anyone else. So they're, they're doing a, a lot of hours. And unlike in the US, you don't get this categorization where you can exempt the employee from overtime. So in most countries, you're paying overtime to anyone other than really senior executives. So it can hit your bottom line because you might have to pay out lots of overtime for people that you can't monitor. Likewise, with annual leave, it's no surprise that the same employees with lots of overtime are also gaining and accruing an awful lot of holiday that they're not taking. Now, the risk to that is that overtime, um, sorry, that holiday, when it's accrued, if you're not actually actively managing it, even if you've got a clause in your contract of employment that bars the carryover, in many countries, if you're not actually pursuing the employee and saying to them, have you actually logged any holiday? Have you got active timetables with regards to when you're going to take that holiday? The local courts will find in favor of the employee and they'll get to secure year upon year of, of carryover of vacation, which has to be paid out on termination, which will add to your termination costs. And the third point to make on remote employees is it's difficult to monitor their performance as well, and you'll find that trial periods go unnoticed, and you'll find that a lot of individuals will reach unfair dismissal rights because of service history without you knowing. And the difference between an individual with unfair dismissal rights and not 
is probably best illustrated by the example in Italy. So in Italy, your managerial employees within the first six months are in the trial period and you can terminate without notice and you don't need just cause after that six months. They get six months notice and you've got unfair dismissal right to consider as well. So that's a cautionary tale as well um, with regards to managing your remote employees. And I know that um, I think Julie's had experience with regards to the carryover vacation um, in, in particular countries. And I, I wonder if you could just explain as to how that possibly has cropped up in, in, in your experiences, Julie. Uh, we seem to have, have lost Julie. So um, I think um, we, we've potentially wrapped up the presentation um, and I'm, I'm very aware that you've obviously got questions that need to be to be answered. So questions have been coming in during the course of the, the webinar and I'll pass over to, to Becky to actually um, put those to the floor. Great. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you uh, to Julie, Tammy, and Joe as well uh, for your insights and stories. As Stuart said, we just have a few minutes remaining for Q&A, uh, so I have a few questions queued up. Uh, starting with uh, Stuart, a question uh, concerning BRIC countries. Uh, is Brazil really that expensive or hard of a country to have employees in compared to, let's say, other BRIC countries? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a really good question, and you've probably noticed that Brazil has cropped up throughout this presentation. So, I mean, to put some perspective on it, you, you've, you've got high salary costs. There's no doubt about it. We mentioned the figure of 125% of what um, you're probably paying in the U.S. for your managers. You would, you'd pay a lot more um, in, the, in, in Brazil. But what, what makes it difficult as well is that you've got a lot of statutory rights. And on top of that, you've got collective agreements that you, you basically need to, to adhere to as well. All of that adds to a lot of terms and conditions of employment. So indirectly, you've got a lot of, of, of administration requirements, your staff rec records, your interaction with the unions. All of this is just, it's just adding to those indirect costs to it. So it makes the cost per head for each um, employee it, it probably outstrips a lot of the other developing countries or the, the other BRIC countries by about two to three times. And I don't know whether Joe, I mean, Joe, having um, the, the, the most experience of Brazil, it's probably good to draw upon his experiences uh, as well. Any comment on that, Joe? Yeah, I mean, Stuart, your own point, in terms of the total cost of the employee is, uh, is pretty high. I, if I recall well, if, uh, if we pay 100 to employee, the total cost for the company is roughly 180, so 80 percent more. This That's number can be refined, and this is basically because of how the salaries are structured. Because there is a 13th salary, there's a, a vacation bonus, there's a, a 401k penalty if you have to, uh, which is the uh, the the long-term savings that if you if you let the employee go, you have to pay like a 40 percent. So there's a lot of uh, statutory uh, requirements that you need to comply. I think the the focus the, um, the management needs to have is not is first of all foremost be aware of the cost per employee and total cost per employee, but also the revenue you want to get from those employees. So have very tight your revenue model going to a foreign country. Agreed. That, no, thanks for that, Joe. So any other questions, Becky? Absolutely. Um, one particular one. Um, how long does it take for a U.S. company to obtain a visa in the U.K. or France? Huh. A, a long time is the, is the simple answer to that. So um, in the U.K., what makes it difficult is the fact that the work permit is probably stage two. Stage one, you've, you've got to get a sponsorship license first. So every employer in the U.K. Um, needs to apply for a sponsorship license, and that basically is a, a test of the individual entity um, against trading history, um, your bank, your tax records. So you've got to be a fully fully operational entity um, to actually get the sponsorship license, and then you're allocated a number of work permits after that. So if you consider the length of time to become operational to satisfy the work perm um, to satisfy the sponsorship license requirements. And then the time it takes you to get the sponsorship license, which is about three months, 
and then the work permit um, allocation after that, I mean, you're looking at probably six to eight months in, in total. And in France, France is a little bit easier. They haven't got the sponsorship license um, requirement as such, but the bureaucracy in, in France is such that the, um, the, the time scales are probably pushing towards sort of four to six months in total in France as well. So Julie, um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's worth mentioning that obviously France, um, UK and a lot of the European countries have a lot of administration. There's, they're countries whereby um, a lot of, of, of entrants want to come in for, for the work there, Thai paid work. But Julie's got experience, I believe, of Malaysia where it, similarly um, the, the processes can be quite convoluted. I uh, don't know whether we've got Julie. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, coming through. Oh, great, <laughs> great. Sorry, I had a little bit of technical difficulty here. I do have experience in Malaysia. Um, I had an employee that was traveling back and forth to a strategic partner that we had worked um, on a business business visit business visa with, um, and decided we need a longer term solution. Um, we pursued a work permit, and it took just about three months, um, but with proper documentation, you can definitely make it move a lot more quickly. Very good. So I think, um, Becky, I, I don't know whether we've got time for any more questions, because by my I think we have time for, for one minute. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more. I love to squeeze in as many as I can, but just one more. Um, You're so cruel. <laughs> Um, is there any notion of a homogenized or equal benefits across all countries approach to fairness? Uh, I would say no. I mean, our experience is that that is the it's the target for most of our clients is to, just to get uh, a standardized set of benefits for all of their employees from an equality perspective. And also, from an administrative perspective, it would be just so much easier to manage. But to be honest, most countries... The benefit system for supplemental benefits is underpinned by Social Security. So what the Social Security schemes don't give, then really the supplemental benefits are there to actually provide for. So you'll find that because each country has different Social Security benefits, then it figures that you've got different, um, a different layer of supplemental benefits on top of that. So no one country is the same. Uh, I think Tammy, um, I mean, T Tammy's got experience of benefits from, from, from her experiences in HR for Black Duck, and I, I think that's fair to say, Tammy, is, is it? It is fair to say. I yeah. would love the opportunity for us to have the same um, <laughs> uh, benefits across all the countries, but the reality is that you know, there's different requirements, different benefits that you offer, um, certainly different, different pension schemas between the UK, France, Germany. Um, and even in Japan. So as much as we'd love a homogenized uh, set of benefits that everyone can participate in, the reality is to be a competitive company in, in a global environment, you must actually um, be you know, providing best practices and what's uh, fair within the country of origin and, and what's best for the employees to, to want to, to participate and be a part of the company. So. Very good. Yeah, so I, I really do think we're, we're at the end of our time now. So, I mean, on behalf of myself, I'd, I'd really just like to thank everyone who's attended today. And I know it's been a whistle-stop tour of all of the, the countries and the issues, but I do hope it's given you a flavor to, to, to look out for, for some of those items that will actually add to your, to your local costs. Um, many thanks to, to the CFO Roundtable for obviously hosting this, to Becky, and also um, a lot of thanks to, to Tammy, Joe, and Julie for, for joining me as well and sharing in their experiences. Now, we will be answering all of the questions that haven't been aired um, on the webinar today, so we'll send out emails in response to your questions um, after the event. And um, if you've got any real-time um, issues with regards to your international business and you need Nair & Co. to help, then obviously drop us a line as well. And We've left you with um, Yvonne's email address for that purpose. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Stuart. And I'd like to echo thank you, Joe and Julie and Tammy as well for sharing your expertise and time. We can consider this program a wrap. Of course, again, if you have any questions for either organization, the CFORoundtable.com or NERCO.com. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy your day.